It was almost 10 years ago when the movie Heaven is for Real came out. It's based on a book by the same name, the same title. It was written by a, a man who happened to be a pastor whose son, four-year-old son, had died, was pronounced clinically dead, but then was revived, brought back to life. And his son claimed, t told his father, his parents, that he had gone to heaven during the time that he was supposedly dead, or clinically, actually was clinically dead. The father, when he first hears the son tell him that he went to heaven, is incredibly skeptical, thinks this is all in his son's imagination, thinks he just kind of had this traumatic experience and is making it all up, kind of had these vivid dreams, until the son starts telling him some details that the father can't explain any other way, how he could know some things that, that he says, he claims, the son claims he received during this near-death experience. One of the most striking details is that the son says that he saw his grandfather, who, who apparently he had never met. But the son had only seen pictures of his grandfather as an old man. And yet when he describes his grandfather to his, his father, the, the son of the grandfather, um, when he describes it to his pastor father, he describes him as a 30-year-old man. And perfectly accurately, according to his father, who as a little kid knew his father, Knew, knew him as a 30-year-old man and certainly seen many pictures of him as a 30-year-old man. It was that and a number of other details that convinced the father that his son actually had gone to heaven, that heaven is for real. And hence, he writes the book about his son's experience. I'm a lot like the father. I am very skeptical about near-death experiences. After having studied them pretty in depth over a number of years, I find myself unconvinced, completely convinced. Certainly the, the, the evidence for near-death experiences is, is nowhere close to the kind of evidence that compels me to believe in, in Christ, in Christianity. That evidence is in a totally different category, actually a category by itself. Near-death experiences tend to be, in my mind, terribly subjective. So while I, I am convinced that they are real, I think it's more likely that they're real than not. I'm not completely sold, especially on every single account. I think many of them are not really what's called veridical. They, they don't coincide with reality. But there are a number of them that have some impressive details, like the story of the son with the father, actually in some cases more, much more impressive, that convince me that, that there is something to them. And given the framework, the worldview that I think there is tremendous proof for, the Christian worldview, that there is an eternity, I, I tend to accept that, that that some people at least have legitimate, real, valid, authentic experiences of the afterlife, of encounters with God. One of the things that has convinced me of that, and I've, I've talked about this in uh, another blog and other places, is some of the veridical details that people report. There have been a number of studies, big studies, that have been done on near-death experiences. And one of the most impressive things is that there are people who have been born blind from birth who claim to be able to see during these experiences. And, and when they come back, and again, these are people that have never seen before. They don't know what it's like to see. They don't have sight. When they come back and they describe what they have seen, they describe in a way that only a seeing person could. As I've outlined in the the previous blog where I talked about this, there are ways to explain that subjectively. Like, for example, um, epistemologists, philosophers who, who um, um, uh, um, are experts in the study of knowledge, how we gain knowledge as human beings, talk about how language is a given, that the structure of language is within us, and we kind of just tap into it, we, we discover it. It's not something that we actually learn comes from the outside into us. It's something that's already there. The apparatus is already in our minds. In a similar way, that could be true with sight. There isn't any proof of that, but that could be true with sight, that, that the structure of seeing, of being able to see, is there. And so a person who has never seen before through a traumatic experience, like a near-death experience, that, that could somehow trigger the ability to, to see during that experience, quote-unquote, see, even though they remain blind. But Regardless, even though there's a way to explain that, I, I admit that's, that's pretty um, significant evidence in favor of near-death experiences. And so I'm inclined to, to accept them. Again, I, I, don't, I don't base my worldview on them. I would never do that because I think they're too subjective to be able um, to base your worldview in. But I, I admit there's some pretty impressive evidence for them. So if you believe that near-death experiences are real, if you believe heaven is for real, then you also have to accept that 
hell is for real? In my study of near-death experiences, one of the things that I have come across more recently in my study of them is the fact that anywhere from 1 to 15% of them, of the people who have them, report having not a really great experience, a wonderful experience, a heavenly experience. Instead, they report having an incredibly distressing, horrific experience, a hellish experience in some cases. The reason that, that there's so much variable between the percentages is that, it, it, depending on the study, there have been a number of large studies that have been done, it's either 1% that report the distressing experience or as much as 15%. So what most people who look at this do is they kind of average that out. They, they use the mean of 8%. So roughly 8% of people who have had these near-death experiences report them being distressing, even hellish experiences. What everybody who studies near-death experiences admit, says, is that that is vastly underreported. And it's a simple reason why. If you, if you think you went to heaven and you come back, you want to share that with everybody. Not just because it's a wonderful experience and you want to talk about it. It's like when you have a great meal at a restaurant, you want to tell everybody about it. But it's because of what it kind of says about you. You went to heaven, <laughs> which means you must be a good person because you went to heaven. You got your eternal reward, or at least you're on the brink of an eternal reward. But for those who have the distressing, the hellish experiences, they, they probably are embarrassed by the fact that they had that, especially in light of the fact that so many people have these wonderful, amazing, heavenly experiences. And on top of that, um, much like a, a combat veteran who doesn't want to talk about the hell of combat because it, it brings it all up, it dredges it all up, what many scholars speculate is that these um, distressing, hellish experiences are underreported because people don't want to relive them. There's kind of like a PTSD to them. And there's a number of other reasons that scholars think that these uh, kind of distressing experiences go um, severely underreported. But there, there is um, no doubt that people do have these distressing experiences, and probably far more frequently than not. M many people have not a heavenly experience, but a very hellish experience. In doing research, I have come across some ways that people have tried to interpret or understand these hellish experiences versus the heavenly and put it all together. One such attempt was um, somebody who was trying to fit it into Tibetan Buddhist cosmology and simply talk about the hellish experiences as um, part of a stage of successive stages that eventually lead to Nirvana. I've read other books by New Age authors who will try to do something similar with it. New, New Age has a whole variety of understandings of what happens when you die, um, depending on the person writing the book. But they have kind of tried to do the, the same thing. Talk about it as a stage. If, if somebody's having a distressing experience, it's not the, the final destination. It's just a stage to where they will finally be released and, and have that heavenly experience. The only problem with those explanations, as nice as they sound, that everybody will make it to a heavenly experience, is that they don't honor the data. There is a lot of hard data when it comes to these near-death experiences. And, and the idea that there are successive stages, that this isn't the final destination or that something else happens is pure speculation. There's no evidence for that. And that's why those kinds of arguments remain largely unconvincing, at least to me. There is a lot of hard data because even though the people who study this will, will say that there needs to be a whole lot more research into it, there have been a number of big studies of hundreds and upon hundreds, even thousands uh, of people who've had these near-death experiences. And in those studies, there, there's kind of a, a, a common elements, common features that people experience. Not that everybody experiences every one, but, but the, the majority of them, there's kind of like hard data around what exactly these near-death experiences um, comprise, what they consist of. Most people, when they're pronounced clinically dead, when they have this kind of near-death experience, it will experience an out-of-body experience. They'll hover over the operating table. Most of them will, will uh, report going down this tunnel, this long tunnel, and seeing a bright light at the end of it. Frequently, people will experience the bright light communicating to them telepathically somehow. And usually when people talk about the bright light, they don't talk about it as simply like an, an inanimate object, a light. They talk about it as a being of light. They, they experience it in a personal way, not just communicating telepathically to them, but somehow their encounter with it is a very personal, profoundly personal 
encounter. And when people describe what it's like to encounter that light, to experience that light, they'll talk about an experience of, of pure peace, pure bliss. And, and the way that they tend to most frequently capture it is to describe it as an intense experience of unconditional love, an intense experience of unconditional love. So good that most people don't want to go back. Most people somehow, whether it's communicated telepathically or they intuit it somehow, understand that they need to go back, that they can't stay, but they want to stay. It's that good. And, and um, when, while during the, the course of this whole thing, it happens in, in d different places, just d depending on different um, uh, just, um, experiences people have, but some, somewhere during the course of this experience, going down the tunnel to the bright light, it communicating telepathically, um, either at the beginning or the end or throughout, there's this life review. They, they kind of see their whole life on a screen before them, all the, the good things they've done and all the bad things they've done. And there's kind of both a sense of, of um, regret and um, not pride, but just you know, uh, happiness at the fact that, that they did good things in their life, the good things that they did. Um, in many of these instances, people will see other beings of light. Sometimes those beings of light are people they know. Other times they aren't. Other times they're perfect strangers and later on putting the pieces together, sometimes, not always, will figure out who those people were, but they encounter other, other people, other human beings um, in, in that experience. When people get back, not in the moment, but when people get back, many times they will interpret their experience in light of their religious expectations. So if they're Hindu, they, they would say that what they've experienced, what they've encountered in the being of light is Shiva. If they're Christian, they'll say Jesus, of course. If they're Muslim, obviously they'll say Allah and so on and so forth. But that interpretation of the experience only happens afterwards. Not, they, don't, they don't say that they knew that in, in the moment. But it is a good question to ask, what of in these near-death experiences, what worldview, what religion do they most coincide with? <laughs> well, certainly, given the hard data, they don't coincide with something like Tibetan Buddhist cosmology. It doesn't coincide closely with that at all. It doesn't coincide with different variations of the New Age. In fact, the, the one religion, the one worldview that these experiences coincide most with happens to be Christianity. Let me explain. For one thing, in these experiences, it's clear that there is um, some kind of life review, some kind of moral basis. It's a moral universe. And, and they do experience, people do experience regret at the things that they, um, they have not done right, the way they have mistreated people. And they experience a, a kind of sense of fulfillment, satisfaction, rightness about the things that they did do well. So there's a sense in which it's a moral universe with that life review. Moreover, there is a sense of, of judgment, of a final judgment, that there is a, a destination that is hellish and a destination that is heavenly. And that hellish destination is described at times, like one of the, the reports that I read that, that um, was most intriguing to me, is that um, this person was going down the tunnel towards the light, which when people, like I said, describe that in those heavenly experiences, it's awesome, it's amazing, they don't want to come back, they, they're drawn to it, it's just this incredible feeling of, of warmth, intense experience of unconditional love. But this person described it as being absolutely agitated, like the closer and closer they got to the light, the more painful, the more agitated they got. They, they, it, there was something about that light that they wanted no part of. So there, there's a way in which the, the cosmology of a final judgment of a heaven and hell, of an eternal destiny that, that this life is working towards, it is affirmed through near-death experiences in ways that it, it, it doesn't affirm other cosmologies, other ways of looking at things like whether that would be reincarnation or, or stages in eternity to some kind of final destination. And lastly, and I think this is the thing that, that most distinguishes the near-death experiences as, being, as coinciding with Christianity, is that and they, they talk almost uh, you know, unanimously, consistently, when people do have that encounter with the being of light, as describing it as an intense experience of unconditional love. And of all the religions, all the worldviews, uh, worldviews that are out there, 
none really says that outside of Christianity. Love is central to Christianity in a way it's not central to any other religion or world view. Even religions that, that talk about God as being loving or, or talk about loving your neighbor as yourself, love is not central to them. And the quality of that love, what often is called grace, but it's basically unconditional love, it is also distinct in Christianity. Love in, in other um, traditions, other understandings, tends not to have that dimension of unconditionality. And yet that's what people describe in this being of light that they are encountering. So again, I would never use near-death experiences to try to prove that Christianity is true, to argue that, that the Christian worldview is, is um, ultimate reality, is the, the truth. But given how good the evidence is otherwise, near-death experiences, I think, can be used to verify, to corroborate the Christian worldview. And, and even though, again, I'm skeptical about them and, and I'm doing this in a very tenuous way, um, and, and I know it's a little bit of a stretch, I would say that if they do affirm any worldview, it is the Christian worldview, a God of unconditional love. I met a person who once had a near-death experience in one of the churches I worked in many years ago. And the amazing thing about it, when he would talk about this experience, I think he, um, he ate some shellfish and went into anaphylactic shock. He didn't know that he was allergic or developed an allergy at some point later in his life. And so he was pronounced clinically dead, and I believe if I remember the story right, in the ambulance. He was in an ambulance being rushed to the hospital and his heart stopped. And they were able to revive him and bring him back. But when he talks about that experience, it's amazing how, how he glows when he starts talking about it. And he describes all the, those common elements of, of the, you know, going down the tunnel, the, the bright light. But the thing that, that struck me most about it was how he said he just didn't want to come back. He said it was just like pure bliss, pure love, and he didn't want to leave. He wanted to stay. He, he somehow knew it wasn't in words, but he, he knew that um, what God was communicating to him, this is how he understands it later, it was Christ communicating to him. He needed to come back to, to finish business here on earth, that God had a plan for the rest of his life so he couldn't stay. But it made him sad that he couldn't stay. He wanted to be there. And, and as he talked about death um, that, that eventually he will experience again, he had no fear whatsoever. In fact, he longed for it. Not that he would do anything to precipitate his death because he knew that God had a purpose for him here, but that he, he couldn't wait. He couldn't wait to die because he couldn't wait to be back in the presence of that being of light. That being of light who I would submit to you is Jesus Christ, is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God of unconditional love. And the one thing that Jesus wants us to know that about death, the one thing that, that his life, death, and resurrection are communicating to us, that when we are in him, when we place our trust in him, we have no need to fear death. Not that we want to precipitate our own because he has a purpose for here on earth, but that, but that we can trust that, that his perfect love casts out all fear. That when we come into his presence, we are going to experience that pure bliss because we are going to be in the presence of his pure, perfect, unconditional love. So what do you think about near-death experiences? Have you ever met somebody who's had one, ever talked to somebody who, who described one? Have you done any studying of them or reading about them? I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. You can go to the Contact EJ page of the Raising Jesus website and leave your comments there. I look forward to hearing from you.